Let us join together in prayer this morning. Almighty God, we thank you so much for gathering us together here today. Open up our hearts, our minds, and our lives that we might hear the word that you have prepared for us. That we might find an opening, a doorway into your story. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I'm from Pittsburgh, and uh, (laughs) every chance I get, I'm probably going to remind you of that. (laughs) I love being from here now, but uh, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, just moved down here not too long ago, and one of the things that we learn as Pittsburghers about our city that makes it uh, so unique is that outside of Vatican City... We have the largest crash in the world, the largest nativity scene in the world, publicly displayed in our downtown plaza by the Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh. It's just, it's gigantic. I think it's eight feet tall statues. It's huge. There's something about the nativity scene that makes it really special to my family, even before I knew that, even before I learned that fact about Pittsburgh. One year I was home from college and I had decided that since my mother had been collecting these nativity scenes for so long, I was finally going to count how many we have. I started on the tree and uh, after I got past the mid-40s, I said, that's it, I'm not spending my break doing this. (laughs) I was just the tree. There's something in that scene that I think speaks to all of us. I think... This time of year when we we see that image, it resonates in our hearts and our minds. It captures our imaginations in a way that I'm not quite sure we're always aware of. We, We know it's special to us, but it speaks to us in a way that goes beyond words. This moment frozen, frozen in time, captures within our collective imaginations the contours and the rich depths of the story of faith to which we feel a calling, I believe. I invite you to journey with me for a few moments into this uh, scene that has been so beautifully displayed for us uh, on the altar this morning. Sorry, choir. (laughs) Now, usually in this scene... And in all, most of the ones that we have in our house, there's an angel. It's missing here, and that's okay, but there's an angel oftentimes in the crash scene. And it's appropriate that it's not here because nowhere in any of the Christmas stories do we find an angel at the manger. So it, it's okay that it's not here, but a lot of them have it. Why is it so prevalent in the crash imagery? Why is the angel so prevalent? Well... We heard Deb read this morning the angel speaking to the field, to the shepherds out in the field, calling them to come bear witness. We also remember that an angel appeared to Mary and an angel appeared to Joseph and an angel appeared to Elizabeth to tell them about this Christ event that was going to be happening, right? And so an angel is part of the story, but not usually in this scene. When I think about what an angel means, when I think about what an angel means. I think back to the Old Testament where the word in Hebrew that can be translated angel often gets translated royal message bearer. Boy, how appropriate is that for this scene? That the angel out in the field speaking to the shepherds was the royal message bearer of this Christ child. Now, I'm about to go further into this scene, but I want to say here, if you don't hear yourself anywhere else at this cradle this morning, maybe you're called to be a royal message bearer for Christ in your life. Just maybe. I always like to start with Joseph. I always like to start out with Joseph. You know, Joseph... A lot of the time when you really think about it, maybe he shouldn't be included. Maybe he's not that important in this scene. 
you know, he didn't really play too big of a role in some of this happening. He's just the stepdad after all, right? He's not the, the biological dad of Jesus, but he's the stepdad. And you know, I don't know if you're a step-parent or not. I don't know if you're maybe an adoptive parent or not, but sometimes, sometimes that role gets overlooked. Sometimes they're part of the story, but you know, off to the side, right? But not Joseph. Joseph is always in this scene, and Joseph speaks down to us throughout history, I believe. Throughout history, think about Joseph. He is the one that God said, you will raise my son on earth. That's Joseph. Joseph is the one that stood by an unwed, pregnant, teenage mom carrying a child that wasn't his own. That's Joseph. Joseph is the one, when Jesus would later explain to people how God is a good father. But I bet Joseph was the physical image that Jesus was raised to see when he talked about what it means to be a dad. Joseph was saddled with one of the hardest jobs imaginable. Imagine saying to Jesus, you will listen to me. Saying, you're not my dad. God is. Well, can't argue with you, son. I guess you're right. Joseph. There's a lot about Joseph, I think, that speaks to us, that we can find our way into this scene through Joseph. And then there's, and then there's Mary, right? Mary's only there because of Joseph. She's only in Bethlehem because of Joseph. The prophecy says that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, but it's through Joseph's line that they are there in this moment. Joseph is of the line of David. And because of Joseph, they have to go to Bethlehem to be counted. So Joseph's not a footnote in this story. Without Joseph, this story doesn't happen this way. And this image is not what we have. What about that Mary? That unwed teenage mother? What about that Mary? You know, she was probably as young or younger than a lot of the girls we have in youth group. It's amazing to think about that. I hear every week stresses about tests and interpersonal drama. None of them have told me yet that an angel of the Lord appeared to them and said, you will bear my child. I think that's a pretty big burden for a 13 or 14 year old girl. What do you think? That's a lot to take in. It's a lot to handle. Who is she that God would choose her? She doesn't even probably understand what's happening in that moment. Not that we do. She doesn't know what's happening, the weight of this significance. And yet, this, I'm going to say it again because I think it's so powerful, unwed teenage mother is central to the mission of God's plan for all of us. I don't care who you are or where you've been or what you've done. If she is central to God's plan, I think you've got a role to play. And then what about the Magi? Now enough is said about Mary to fill too many books, and we hear about Mary a lot. But what about these Magi? These fellows right here. They're strange. They're really strange when you think about it. Because if everybody else up here shares one thing in common, they don't. You see, they're not Israelites, right? They're not Jewish. This part isn't even their story, and they're in the picture. They're kind of like wedding crashers that are the life of the party. <laughs> they're not supposed to be here, are they? These magi, these wise men from afar, they're probably Zoroastrian priests. That doesn't quite fit, does it? And yet here they are. They've taken a journey. They followed a star. Why are they often thought of as Zoroastrian priests? Well, if you don't know what Zoroastrianism is, you do. 
uh, if you've ever heard of astrology or you check your horoscope. That's where that comes from. So these star watchers, these stargazers, they know. They, they know. They've been watching the stars and they see a new star appear and it leads them to this place. I think that tells us just how powerfully creation was speaking, all of creation was speaking to this moment. Not only that, but those from outside the faith could come and still testify that this is the king of Israel. We have people from outside the story testifying to the power of the story. Maybe this morning you're here, maybe this morning you're here and you're saying, you know, I'm just here to make somebody else happy. I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. I don't really understand anything that's going on. It's probably how these guys felt. And yet they were there to bear witness and testify. They speak down to us today. You know, it's interesting. I, I still, we still see remnants of the Magi in the, the story this time of year. My son has two weeks off of school. A lot of kids do. Yeah, pray for me. <laughs> a lot of kids do this time of year. They get it off coincidentally, right? It's a coincidence. It's around December 25th when we celebrate Jesus' birthday. This so happens. Or maybe it's a, a remnant still of our culture remembering that there's something important about that date. There's something important that time needs to pause. Time needs to pause. Even the market's closed for a day, right? The world still testifies in its own sort of way that there's something going on here. And then last, always last, are the shepherds. I love to talk about them last. See, I identify with the shepherds probably most of all. These shepherds, think about them for a moment. They're raising sheep, they're raising goats. So, let's see, the best words to describe them were be dusty, dirty, filthy, um, walking bacterial contamination units. <laughs> and they are invited into the delivery room of the child of God. Some commentators like to point out that before Jesus Christ transformed our image of shepherd in the New Testament, that most of Jewish culture, Arab culture, Greek culture, viewed shepherds as outsiders, outcasts, people who were shiftless, dishonest, people who grazed their flocks on other lands, and thieves. And yet here they are. They're invited to the manger scene. They're invited to bear witness to the king of kings being born in this low estate. I mean, sure, you expect to see them nearby, but they're the part of the story that more polite company likes to just kind of leave out of the conversation. And yet, it's not a manger scene without shepherds. We were over in the foundry this morning at the first service, and there's Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and shepherds, and that's it. And everybody knows the whole scene just by that, right? Because shepherds are central to the story. If shepherds, shepherds have been called by God to be an important part of this story, to bear witness to the birth of Jesus Christ. If shepherds are central to our image of this entire moment, shepherds, then don't tell me that you're not good enough to be there too. Don't tell me that, none of, uh, that you're not good enough to be used by God, to be called by God, to be loved by God, to be important to God, to be central to God's story in the world around you if shepherds are standing there. Because you are. It's really 
when you think about this whole scene, it's really no wonder that the God of the entire universe chose this setting, this motley collection of individuals. They don't necessarily seem to make sense, but I think that's the point. Because in this scene, in this moment captured for us, this miracle of a moment captured for us for all eternity in our minds, eyes, and in our imagination, each of us can find ourselves beside the manger, testifying, bearing witness, sensing the joy of that Christ child. Each of them represent for us a doorway in as we see ourselves in them. You know, God chose the powerless people, the Israelites, Mary and Joseph. God chose the outcasts, the shepherd, the unwed mother. God chose these people to bear witness to what he was doing in the world. God chooses us too. God chooses us too. God chose the power brokers in the world, the magis, we three kings. Throughout history, God chose the Babylonians and the Persians and the Medes to carry out God's will. There's a place for each and every one of us in this story that we celebrate at Christmas time. This scene captures for each of us in this moment the full meaning of the Christ event breaking into our own lives. Because no matter where we come from or where we stand right now, whether we believe or not, have given our lives over to be guided by God, yet or not, that we are each invited to experience the person of God in this child. No matter how high or low we might feel about ourselves, we are called to live into and to celebrate and to share the joy of that moment and that Christ in our lives. This is the miracle of the moment of Christmas. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you today and we are so grateful that even after all of these years, we have remembered. We have remembered the story. We have remembered your call to us. We have remembered your call to those like us that we can still find ourselves in your story. Lord, we pray today, live out your story among us and through our lives. Live out your story powerfully in this place, we pray. In your holy name.